Greetings students and welcome back to another video on complex variables. In this lesson, I'm going to state and prove three well-known techniques that allow you to find the residues of a complex function. This is going to come in handy when applying the residue theorem and when integrating complicated real functions as we'll see in the next video. So let's start. Suppose I have a complex function with the following Laurent series. Recall from my Laurent series video that a Laurent series is essentially a generalized Taylor series that includes rational expressions which have negative powers on z, in other words the b series or the principal part, in addition to the polynomial portion that you find in a typical Taylor series, or the analytical part, this a series. Recall also that the residue of a function f of z at a particular point z0 is the coefficient b1 in the Laurent expansion of f of z around z0. So this b1 right here, the coefficient of the 1 over z minus z0 term. This very brief explanation actually gives rise to the first technique used to find the residue of f of z at z0, which just involves finding the Laurent expansion of f of z around z0 and then just taking out the b1 from that Laurent expansion. I don't really need to prove this considering that this is, after all, the definition of the residue, so let's just skip straight to an example. In this example, we want to find the residue of sine z over z squared at z0 equals 0. This is fairly simple. We know that the Taylor expansion, or the power series representation for sine z about z equals 0, is given by z minus z cubed over 3 factorial plus z to the 5 over 5 factorial and so on. That means the Laurent expansion of sine z over z squared would just be this Taylor expansion of sine z divided by z squared. And if we simplify everything, then we'll get 1 over z minus z over 3 factorial plus z cubed over 5 factorial and so on. And the powers will keep getting higher as we keep going. So the residue of sine z over z squared at 0 is just the coefficient of the 1 over z minus 0 or 1 over z term, which in this case is just 1. The second technique I'm going to talk about doesn't involve finding the Laurent expansion. It applies to cases where you can't find the Laurent expansion or you just don't want to. It specifically applies to when your function f of z has a simple pole at z0 and you want to find the residue at that simple pole. Recall that by a simple pole, I mean a pole about which the Laurent expansion of f of z only goes up to the 1 over z minus z0 term in the Laurent expansion. In other words, this summation in the principal part up here only has b1 as the non-trivial term. Everything else is just 0. The second technique is also pretty simple. All you do is multiply the function f of z by z minus z0 and take the limit as z approaches z0. Proving this technique is also fairly simple. So let's suppose for the proof that f of z has a Laurent expansion about z0 given by the following expression, you know, the one we mentioned above. Now because z0 is a simple pole of f of z, this b series here only goes up till j equals 1. So the Laurent expansion of f of z can be simplified to the following. The sum from k equals 0 to infinity of a k times z minus z0 to the k plus b1 over z minus z0. So now the principal part contains just the b1 term. Let's now multiply both sides by z minus z0 to get the following equation. Now what happens when we take the limit of both sides as z approaches z0? Well, this first summation term goes away since it contains powers of z minus z0 greater than or equal to 1. On the other hand, this second term, the constant b1, the residue, it just stays there. So we can say that the residue of a complex function f of z at a simple pole z0 is just the limit as z approaches z0 of z minus z0 times f of z. Now just to clarify, the reason we use the limit is that f of z is actually undefined at z0. Z0 is still a pole after all, even though it's a simple pole. And if you multiply f of z by z minus z0 and evaluate the whole result at z0, you would just end up with a 0 over 0, which is undetermined. So that's why we've used the limit, so you technically don't get 0 over 0, and everything turns out okay. Let's now do an example to illustrate this technique. In this example, we want to find the residue of cosine z over z to the 4 minus 1 at z equals i. Let's begin by factoring the denominator. So when we multiply by z minus z0, which in this case is z minus i, then we can more easily cancel out the terms. 
you know that z to the 4 minus 1 is just z squared minus 1 times z squared plus 1, and that z squared plus 1 is just z minus i times z plus i. So let's just plug this factored form into the equation for f of z, and this is what we'll get. Now because cosine z is continuous and differentiable, or holomorphic at z equals i, that means z equals i must be a simple pole since z minus i only appears once in the denominator. So that means we can use technique number 2 to find the residue at z equals i, because z equals i is a simple pole, and technique number 2 only applies to finding residues at simple poles. In this case, the residue is just the limit as z approaches i of z minus i times cosine z over z squared minus 1 times z minus i z plus i. And if we cancel the z minus i terms, we end up with this equation. Now if we want to take the limit of this expression at z equals i, we can do that very easily just by substituting in z equals i. The denominator becomes negative 2 times 2i, which is negative 4i. But the tricky bit is with the numerator, and even if you try to use a calculator that has complex numbers, you end up with a math error. Still, there's a trick you can use to evaluate cosine i using the Euler formula. And with the Euler formula, you can isolate and find an expression for cosine z in terms of just exponentials. I leave it up to the viewer to show that cosine z is e to the iz plus e to the negative iz divided by 2. It's kind of like cosine x, which is e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. You might be able to see the analogy there. If you use this equation for cosine z, then you'll find that cosine i is just e plus e inverse over 2. So the residue of cosine z over z to the 4 minus 1 at z equals i is just negative e plus e inverse over 8i. And that solves our example. Now before using technique number 2, you might wonder, how do I know if the function has a simple pole at z equals z naught? What if it's a pole of higher order, or what if it doesn't even have poles? How can I find that out before using technique number 2? Well, the answer lies in the Laurent series times z minus z naught expression I wrote up here, which I'll copy paste below. Now, if I didn't have a pole at z naught, then all my b coefficients would be zero since my function would be completely analytic at that point. Therefore, if I then took the limit of this expression as z approaches z naught, then I would just end up with a zero residue. However, if my z naught was a higher order pole, then in addition to the b1 term in my b series, I would also have a b2 term and even terms beyond b2, up to the order of the pole of course. Note that the terms beyond b2 have one less power on the z minus z naught in the denominator, mainly because we've already multiplied it out once. Now if I take the limit of this expression as z approaches z naught, then because of these extra terms corresponding to the higher order pole, we get infinity for the limit. Therefore, if I then took the limit of z minus z naught times f of z when z naught is a higher order pole, I get infinity. So that's how you can tell you have a simple pole. If this limit is zero, then the function doesn't have a pole at z naught, and it's totally analytic there. When this limit is infinity, the pole at z naught is a higher order pole. And when the limit is a non-zero finite number, then you do have a simple pole at z naught, and the limit is just the residue b1. So this quantity, this limit, isn't just a way to calculate residues for simple poles, it's also a diagnostic tool to check whether or not you even have a simple pole at z naught. And that completes the discussion for technique number 2. Let's go to the third and final residue calculation technique, and the second technique you saw just applied to simple pole z naught. This technique number 3 is an extension, and it now applies to higher order poles. It's not as easy as the other ones, and let me begin first by describing how it works. Suppose you want to find the residue of the function f of z at z equals z naught, and z naught turns out to be a non-simple pole, turns out to be a higher order pole. In fact, suppose that the order of the pole z naught is n. So what you do is you start by multiplying f of z by z minus z naught to the power m, where m is some integer that's greater than or equal to the order of the pole n. Then what you do is you differentiate z minus z naught to the m times f of z, m minus 1 times. And the third step is to divide that derivative by m minus 1 factorial, and then evaluate the result at the pole z naught. 
and then this final quantity is your residue at the non-simple pole Z0. Now when it comes to proving this technique, the book I was reading just said that the proof was very simple and left it as an exercise to the reader. I'm not like that, well, sometimes, so following the famous words of the tank commander slash head coach legend Byron Scott, I'm going to man up and prove this technique to you. Let's start with the Laurent series of f of z. Now when z0 is a pole of order n, we can expand out the b series so that it goes until the b sub n term. Now let's start with the first step of technique 3. Multiply f of z by z minus z0 to the power m where m is an integer greater than or equal to n. Now because m is greater than or equal to n, all these powers of z minus z0 in the principal series, the b series, all those powers are going to be positive, which makes differentiation more straightforward. Now let's apply the second step and differentiate this whole expression m minus 1 times. If we do that, then all the powers on these z minus z0 terms in this a series will reduce by m minus 1, and we'll also be multiplying the coefficient a sub k by k plus m times k plus m minus 1 times all the way to k plus 2. This is just using the chain rule and applying it to the differentiation of polynomials. But what about the principal part? Well, if you differentiate the principal part m minus 1 times, then every term which has a power less than m minus 1 will become 0. That's because if you differentiate a polynomial, the degrees or powers on that polynomial are going to keep decreasing with every differentiation until you get a constant term and when you differentiate that constant term you get zero. Therefore all the terms in the B series except for B1 become zero. The B1 term on the other hand is going to have its power reduced by the number of times we differentiate, so m minus 1. In addition, because the power comes down as a coefficient every time we differentiate, we'll also have m minus 1 factorial multiplying b1. And now it's time for the final step of the technique, where we evaluate the derivative at z equals z0 and divide by m minus 1 factorial. If we evaluate the derivative at z equals z0, every term in this a series is going to be 0, leaving only the b1 term. And dividing that by m minus 1 factorial, will just give us the residue b1 as z equals z0. So that's it, we've proven the validity of technique number 3, that if you have a higher order pole at z0, you can multiply that function with that higher order pole, whose residue you want to find, by z minus z0 raised to the power of an integer m, greater than or equal to the order of the pole, then you can differentiate that m minus 1 times, and then divide by m minus 1 factorial and evaluate the derivative at that higher order pole z0 to get the residue. Let's finish off the video with one last example applying this third technique. In this example, we want to find the residue of z cosine z over z minus pi whole cubed at z equals pi. We can already see from the function that the numerator z cosine z doesn't have any poles at z equals pi which means that the denominator is the only factor contributing to the z equals pi pole. And since the denominator contains z minus pi cubed, we can conclude that z equals pi is a third order pole. So let's use technique number 3 and multiply f of z by z minus pi cubed, leaving us with only z cosine z. Now because we multiplied by z minus pi cubed, we have to differentiate this expression 3 minus 1 times. In other words, we find the second derivative. You can use the product rule to show that the second derivative here is just negative 2 sine z minus z cosine z. Finally in the third step, we'll substitute z equals pi and divide by the factorial of 3 minus 1 which is just 2. Sine pi is 0 while cosine pi is negative 1 so for the residue we'll end up with pi by 2. And that should do it for the video. If you enjoyed the lecture, feel free to like and subscribe. In the next complex variables video, we'll talk about how to use the residue theorem to determine integrals, a video that some of you have already requested. Thank you for watching, and this is the faculty of Khan, signing out.